and now, in this moment, I invite each and every one of you to just relax in the great wave that is the divine. If you feel so inclined, go ahead and take a nice deep cleansing breath in, breathing in the cool, calming oxygen that is life itself. And as you release the breath, release all that no longer serves you. Release all doubt and tension. Let your false face just wash away. Go ahead and take another nice deep cleansing breath in. And as you release this breath, allow your body to just relax in this moment. And allow your mind to be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, allow, I invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself up to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. 
I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I, choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. Visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass. In seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words, I accept. knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This could be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in this room or virtually on this broadcast and share in confidence and gratitude in saying, I'm grateful for the good in your lives. All right, I have a number of things to talk about this morning, starting with this. Next Sunday, we're going to have two services, one at 11 a.m., the other at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. will be a candlelight service. And the musicians and we who are speaking have been working on this for quite some time, and we'd love to have you here. Yes, we have, too, been working on it for quite some time. Um, please come out. I have. You know me this time of year, so... It's supposed to be raining and warm that night. Don't let that stop you. Did it stop the Magi? Did it stop the shepherds? Did it stop the angels? Who were like, oh, it's raining. We better stay in heaven tonight. No. <laughs> so you come on. It's not going to flood. It's not crazy weather. It's just, you know. So please come out because it's really going to be a special service. And uh, candles. There will be candles. There will be candles. Lots of candles. Now, have you bought your last-minute Christmas presents? You have. Well, it's pretty darn close, Brian. Unless you use America's favorite online retailer, who will dr drop it by drone on your doorstep. You got. You got seven days. So I have I have some ideas for you, some ideas of what to get. Uh, one of the key things always in gifting people is to listen to what they tell you they want. Listen to what they tell you they want. Unlike the guy who saw his husband's tweet to the husband's friends that said, I'm lucky. I know what I'm getting this Christmas because I have been dropping really precise hints for months now. And the husband who saw this said, now I live in the fear of God. <laughs> then there's the man who in 1915, I think it was, this is what I'm about to tell you, a mix of fact and legend. Some of it's factual. Uh, you can decide which part. 1915, this man's spouse says to him, um, there's an auction coming up 
nearby. We need some new curtains, and a few new dining chairs wouldn't hurt either. Why don't you go to the auction and pick these pick these up, see if they have them in the lot. So he goes to the auction, he sits there, and they either didn't have curtains and dining chairs or he didn't like what he saw, but a parcel of land came up for auction. And he thought, well, that seems reasonable, let's do that. And land's a good investment, which was what he said when he got home after he bought this land. You know what was on the land? Stonehenge. <laughs> it had come out of a private, a private family that had had it for a century or more, and so... You can just picture this conversation. Well, honey, I bought some land, but it's going to need to be cleared before we do it. Well, anyway, they donated it to the people, and the people have gotten to enjoy it ever since. But my favorite story was just in the news yesterday. A, a woman in an assisted living facility in Ohio, 105 years old, has a birthday, turns 105 yesterday, and they asked her, what do you want for your birthday? And she said, well... Three things. I want to watch the Cincinnati Bengals football game because I'm a Bengals fan. Okay. Second is I want a bottle of cinnamon bourbon. And the third is I want a man in uniform. <laughs> so they put her in front of the TV. They got her a bottle of cinnamon. I've never heard of cinnamon bourbon. Have you? Okay. And a firefighter. <laughs> And I guess he sat there and watched the game with her and helped her finish off the whiskey. I don't know. But I thought that was pretty cool. But if you really need a last, so you want to pay attention to what people want. Because you think a 105-year-old woman, she's probably going to want a cake and a little pointy hat on her head, you know, and people fussing around her. And But you got to pay attention because this, and they also say this isn't typically in the list of things that people do to become centenarians is, you know, drink whiskey and watch football, but, you know, whatever works. It took her there, and she's happy with it. So um, if you can't think of what to get anybody and you need a last-minute gift, I have a suggestion for it. I brought it up a couple of weeks ago, and I first got this thing during the pandemic and, and brought it to you on stage. And what it is is a, it's a screaming goat. Have you seen the screaming goat? <laughs> you hear that? Now, this is great for breaking up Zoom meetings. <laughs> At the Christmas table, if the relatives want to talk about politics. <laughs> and Lisa now tells me, she saw, a couple of you saw it on the table up here and knew what I was going to do. Lisa says there's now a holiday goat. It's got a little Santa hat on. So it's like seven bucks on America's favorite online retailer, and you can probably get it just in time for the holiday. Okay, enough. Enough nonsense. Now on to the serious stuff that you came here for today. We're working for another couple of weeks out of, it would help if I cleaned these once in a while. Uh, <laughs> Ernest Holmes out of Silomar. And for this month, what I've been doing with it is um, bringing in not only what he said in the book, but also the people that he references, several of them, who were... Um, teachers in his life or that he became last week was frank eustace and he, he didn't know eustace but eustace he became aware of his work his christian science work the first week in uh, in december we talked about emma curtis hopkins and her connection to Holmes and in a statement that she had made that he then he elaborated on and today you get phineas quimby phineas quimby phineas parker's quimby who's considered one of the pillars of early new thought. He was really a discoverer of certain things. And it, he's often credited with the expression that Christ was the first great scientist of the mind, the science of the mind. Christ knew that there was a principle by which change occurs, that it wasn't a matter of just his special personality or his oneness with God that was exclusive to him, but there's a principle that, that anyone can use. And Holmes draws out Quimby's statement, maybe Quimby's best-known statement. You may, I, I realize a lot of you in the room and a lot of you online have never heard of this person, and you're busy looking him up right now, or you will be later. But uh, the most well-known statement from this largely unknown individual outside of New Thought was that matter is mind in form. 
Matter is mind in form. Mind is matter in solution. Okay? Matter is mind in solution. In other words, they're the same thing at different vibrations of each other, at different stages, different frequencies, different wavelengths of each other. They're the same thing. All there is is this one divine nature which can take on the appearance of substance, of form, when mind moves it to do so. And so Holmes believed that the divine nature has ideas within itself that are not fulfilled, not uh, fully realized, until they take shape as material form to be recognized by sentient beings. That then once they're recognized, are free to redistribute themselves back into the realm of solution or pure potential. So, and we've talked about this many times before, maybe not in this way, but everything is flowing like the tides. Everything is moving into form and then progressing out of form and then coming back into form in a different way, slightly altered, maybe greatly altered. All things are changing. You're sitting in a chair that at one time didn't exist and at one time going forward won't exist. But what will not cease existing is the principle by which chairs are made. Because as long as there are beings, you, me, cats, dogs, whatever else gets up in a chair, as long as there are beings that need some place to sit, the principle will keep creating after its own kind. But you know what? They'll come up with better chairs. Because our ancestors sat on logs, tree stumps, you know, whatever they could find. And then somebody had the bright idea, say, let's put a back on it and elevate it a little bit off the ground. And then somebody had, you know, for a long time, people who came to places like this sat in wooden pews. Did you do that when you were a little kid? Straight up in a, in a little wooden pew. And then you had to kneel on stuff, and it was real uncomfortable. And then I, I don't know when it came in, but they put, they put pads on the kneelers. And they put pads on the chairs, and now it was more comfortable. And now the, now the minister could go on forever in a talk, and no one would object. The choir could sing off key, and nobody would mind because everybody was comfortable. You know, you used to go to the movies. You had a little fold-down chair. You sat there kind of crammed and eating your popcorn. Now you go to the movies, and it says a recliner and drink holders and all this kind of thing, you know. And then a lot of people just say, well, you know where I'm mo most comfortable? At home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay home and I'm wait, I'll wait till this thing's on Netflix or something, and then, I, you know, then I'll watch it. So everything is being refined as it, as it goes. Uh, some ideas go out of fashion for a long time, and nobody thinks about them, and, and then they recapture it. You know, hey, have you, have you seen this? What was it I was reading the other day um, that's coming? Uh, it escapes me right now, but there's, there's something real kind of ordinary that's coming back into fashion. Oh, no, it's not. Hmm. It's not ordinary at all. Not I take that. Mm, oh, I take that back. Before oh gosh, before any of you like really throw a fit, I'm talking about Snoopy. Snoopy. Snoopy is being rediscovered by very young people as being cool. And I'm told you can't find Snoopy stuff. You, screaming goats are everywhere, but Snoopy's hard to find right now because. Uh, the younger generations are snapping it up. And they'll find some way to represent with Snoopy that nobody else has ever thought of. So what I invite you to consider is everything is mind, and some of it seems to stay in the unseen. Another term for mind, because we love uh, synonyms in this teaching, we're constantly swapping out words like for God, what else can we call God? Lately, I'm calling God the divine nature. I think I may stick with that a while. It's been, to me, the source. It's been the ultimate ground of all being. That's complicated, the ultimate ground of all being. Uh, OGB. You have, to, you have to abbreviate it. OGB. OMG. OGB. You know. <laughs> but uh, the divine nature, well, mind is the unseen. 
It's the unseen side of things. And then things move into the scene. And by scene, I mean recognized with all the senses that we have. And they keep adding more senses to the ones that we have. When I was a kid, we had five. Now there are more. But uh, things move into the scene, but they carry the essence of the unseen with them. They carry the mystery with them. Well, now, of the Gospels... And you'll hear a little of the, the Luke birth narrative next week. But the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, is considered the mystical Gospel. And he starts out with the third creation story in Judeo-Christian scripture, the first two being in, in, uh, in Genesis and the Torah. But he, he's, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's a passage of scripture that you hear quoted quite often at this time of year, that the word is made flesh and dwells among us. Well, it's another way of saying the same thing. The word is constantly assuming flesh, quote unquote. It's constantly assuming form and dwelling among us until it doesn't, until it withdraws itself from form back into the realm of pure potential. But we humans being fixated on the space-time continuum, this freaks us out to think that things are going to change, much less disappear altogether. So a question that the disciples had of Jesus frequently in his ministry, especially when he started making noises about leaving, was when are you coming back? What are we going to do in the meantime? We look at things as, well, it's Christmas now. Now it's another year. If you like Christmas, it's another year till Christmas. Or it's months till this. It's, we, we mark time. When is this? And I brought this up before. Garrison Keeler and some others have written about this in humorous ways. You know, we go to the most beautiful place on earth and we stand there looking at it thinking, will I ever be here again? When can I get back here again? We miss what's going on in the moment because we're looking forward to something else, and especially if we're putting our power in the hands of somebody else, even someone we consider a Messiah, we say, look, I need you here. We've talked here before about the heroic journey, you know, and how your mentor abandons you, right? Takes you, you familiar, you're familiar with this? If not, I'll, I can point you in the direction of the literature, but you, uh, you're invited to enter this underground series of caverns, and your mentor says, yeah, yeah, this will be fine. You know, this will be a snap. We'll go through here. You turn around, your mentor is gone, and you're, you're on your own <laughs> to go through here. You come out the other end. You meet up with your mentor again as a peer. Well, this completely, we just lose our bearings about this because we need something. We need something to depend on that's going to carry us through. And there's all sorts of imagery about this that see the footprints in the sand and there was just one pair and this is, that's when I carried you, says God. But that's not really how it works. How it works is the unseen moving into the scene is meant to be managed, carefully managed by us, carefully managed through the selection of what Holmes and Quimby both call the superior thought, the superior thought. You have the superior thought and you have the inferior thought. Now, the inferior thought would be like, um, let's say something happens. There's a conflict of some kind in your life. What's the inferior thought? Retaliate, right? Get even. Um, keep face, you know. Uh, keep looking like uh, you've got this handled. Uh, ruin the other's reputation, um, go around all your friends and spread the word that, you know, this is a bad person, that kind of stuff. Um, dig a hole for yourself, hunker down, make sure that you've got everything you need and, and forget about everybody else. That's an inferior kind of thought. Um, and there are gradations of this. It's not just a binary thing where inferior and Superior, because some superior thought can masquerade as inferior and vice versa. And there are, there are gradations in here as well where, like, um, let's say somebody, um, somebody hurts your feelings. Uh, and you say to yourself, 
Well, here's an example of the gradations. You know, one is retaliation. <laughs> I'll hurt their feelings. Or I'll make sure that they get their feelings hurt somehow. I'll set up a, a plan. I'll hatch a plot, you know, where they get their feelings hurt. That's, that's one level of inferior thought. Another level of inferior thought is pity. Well, they're just stupid. They're just foolish. They're just this, you know. And you make up a story in your head. Now, it's better than the first story, isn't it? But not by a whole lot, <laughs> you know. It makes you look good. It makes you feel good within you. You tell yourself the story makes you feel stronger, okay? Then there, there's an, another level of thought which says, and this is, this is where it gets a little tricky in here because this sounds like a real superior thought is to have compassion for them because they're wounded. That's not a bad thing to do at all, but it's not the best thing to do. The best thing to do is to recognize that they recognize that part of themselves that's never been wounded, that part of themselves that is whole, complete, and dare I say it, perfect, that they recognize that they are of the divine life stream, the divine nature, and there's nothing wrong with them, nor could there ever be. Now, can we do that when they whiz past us and cut into our lane on the road? And I was thinking, you know, back to what Danielle said about this, um, that that's that's a that's not a random act that's a learning opportunity that's a spiritual event right there that's a spiritual workshop right there's so how am i going to handle this how am i going to how am i going to handle this um and i i think back to something else she said when she was talking about this time of year and it was two weeks ago it wasn't even yet this time of year it was that time of year but it was coming on to this time of year two weeks ago and she said in this time of year it seems like people are nicer to each other and ever since she said that i've started like really paying attention out driving and stuff and it does seem like they are and then i realized yeah it kind of is every people are like oh you go ahead no no it's fine it's all good you know and stuff except when they whiz past you and cut into your lane and she said why can't it be like this all the time okay that's the word right there that is waiting to be made flesh, that is waiting to dwell among us, is how good, how happy, how peaceful, how loving, how kind, are we willing to have it be? And are we willing to have that start with us? Even if nobody else wants to play. If everybody else seems stuck in their stuff, are, are we willing? Because we're the only ones that limit the transit of things from mind as solution to mind as matter. We're the only ones who limit that or who delimit it, who take the limitations off. We are the ones who, through the management of our own consciousness, can decide to create a safe space within and around ourselves for all beings, you know, and then it begins to spread. And this is the message of new thought, is instead of trying to isolate, as religion has typically done, trying to isolate who's wrong in this world and go fix them. And if you can't fix them, kill them. You know, uh, punish them in some way. New thought has, yeah, lock them up. New thought has a different idea here, is to start with the self and work outward from there. And if we become, each of us, the person seeking progress, not perfection, to quote from another spiritual program, progress, not, it doesn't mean that instantly tomorrow you've got to be, you know, Gandhi. It took him a while, too, you know. He had some stuff to work out. All of the great ones did. But each day, better and better, somebody brought up, uh, Jose Silva the other night, Nicole, you may recall some of you. Uh, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. And every day, I'm releasing the good for the better. Every day, I'm releasing the need to judge a little more. And you know what this represents? Because the whole thing being is a metaphor from beginning to end. This represents both the descent of spirit into form, as depicted here on the circle in V, as I back into the tree. That'd be funny. Um, Chevy Chase, Chevy, how do you say that? Chevy, Chevy Chase, Chevy, Chevy Chase, Chevy Chase fell off a stage the other night and they thought he was 
doing a prank like he did, <laughs> like he used to do on Weekend Update, and he actually fell off. He didn't see the end of the stage, and he actually fell off. He's all right, happily. So anyway, it represents the descent of spirit, the descent of spirit into form, and it represents the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah. It's uh, why am I having trouble pronouncing words today? It's um. It's all a metaphor. The Word is made flesh and dwells among us, and everybody says, oh, it's the baby Jesus. Well, it is, and it's more. It's the Christ, the Christ principle, the Christ science that coexists with the baby Jesus, that coexisted with the baby you and the next baby born in this world. And every living thing coexists with that. The Word is being made flesh and dwelling among us. So I have a little Holmes passage here to read you. Yeah, this is where he's referencing Quimby big time. It is matter held in solution called mind, called mind, which the power of wisdom can condense into a solid so dense as to become a substance called matter. So when you and I send out a call into consciousness, stuff starts being pulled together, even down to the molecular level. It starts clumping together, okay? And it starts to, it's like a, wow, it's like a 3D printer. It really kind of is, you know? Another metaphor. And here's this, here's this experience. Here's this form that's now being shaped. And the next corner you turn, you walk right into it. Wow. Here it is. And it didn't exist before in this way. And it, it needed me to complete it the way a rainbow needs my retinas to complete it. Because that's where the rainbow actually occurs. Not out there in space somewhere, but the experience of it. Yeah, it's happening through the water droplets in the air, but nobody would know it was there until they saw it and how they see it is within themselves, and then consciousness recognizes it. And as we talked about last week, nothing happens without conscious recognition. You can't experience anything without conscious recognition, and you can't consciously recognize stuff if you're not looking, if you've got things in the way of it. If you say rainbows are an impossibility to you, or joy, or love, or happiness, or peace, or prosperity, or whatever it might be is an impossibility to you, then it could sail right into your living room, and you wouldn't see it because it takes training in consciousness. And so this is the training that we give ourselves. Let me see if I've left anything out here. The word is always becoming flesh. This is a note I made. And in our, uh, and in our own lives, we guide it in doing so. We place limitations or we lift them. That's the glorious idealism of this teaching. This life we're in is not simply heaven's secondhand hand-me-down. Remember that? And the song you sang a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. Okay? This life is for real. This life is in earnest with an A. This, <laughs> this life is, is the substance of spirit taking form. So at this Christmas tide coming up, which uh, now we've prepared for it in the Advent spirit, uh, we've waited for it while preparing and prepared for it while waiting, and we're conscious of the fact that there are angelic beings who represent the message of this coming to us and around us, whether or not you believe in angels with the big wings and all this, uh, you are one of them, and they are announcing something. Now, what is it they're announcing? They're announcing the birth of the Savior idea. And finally, this home said, we believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior in this teaching because because he saved us from wrong thinking. He saved us from the consciousness of fear, inescapable fear, cycling down into that sense of separation from source. Okay? He saved us from that by showing us an alternative, which is to love one another, to love the self, to love the world. So let's know together now, one life, one power, one presence, pure spirit, everywhere, radiant, manifesting. On this spectacularly beautiful day, which we've had a number of here lately. 
where there's a crispness to the air and brilliant sunshine. It is so easy to feel the presence of this one life, this one mind, this divine nature coursing through us. And so I affirm and know for each person listening or watching or doing both, they're right where they are right now. There's a sense of yes, a sense of destiny, a sense of possibility greater than ever before. An awareness that each of us lives in the midst of an infinite creative process that knows what it's doing, that awaits our recognition and our call, awaits the direct impress of our thought and acts upon it. I know this for each of us. I know it for all people everywhere. I know it for the trouble spots on earth, the places where conflict rages, that even so, right there, right there is this Christ-like idea of love and peace and kindness and good. And I affirm and know that it's flourishing now, leaping from heart to heart, doing what needs to be done to heal, to uplift, to bless, and to put war forever behind us. For this knowing and its manifestation and form everywhere I turn, I am so deeply grateful. I release this word now into the infinite, calling it done, and so it is. Everything else is in the newsletter. As we come up to giving time, we have our special usher this morning. Our we have one or two, Martha. Two. We have our special ushers. So please join with me in saying the words that we say every Sunday. I'm not starting to finish it. <laughs> but it, it costs money to keep this center going. It costs money to put the lights on, the music. It costs money to keep everything going here. We really appreciate all you do for us physically and monetarily. And we just ask you to please continue contributing because it really does cost money to keep this place going. So thank you for all you do for us in all directions. And now please say with me, divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all the good I am in that, all the good I give and receive. The only other thing that I wanted, because, you know, how, how do you get the, how do you get, how do you drop a hint? I learned a new way to drop a hint. For, a perf for that perfect last minute gift, borrow their computer and Google what you want. And then th their computer will proceed to pop ads up. And I was like, well, that's just brilliant. So, all right. It is a beautiful day. And when I heard that line in the song, uh, shine a light in every corner of my heart, it reminded me of a meditation that I learned at when I was in ministerial school. Um, so go with me for just a minute, and then we'll end it in a treatment, but we're going to start it in a meditation. So I'm going to encourage you to take a nice deep breath. Just breathe it all the way down. Relax as you release the breath. Now I want you to envision yourself standing within your heart. Visualize your heart around yourself. Now I want you to take one step forward and push that front wall out. Just make that space a little bit bigger. Now step to the left and push that wall out. Now you're going to have to take two steps to the right and push that wall out. Now come back to the center and then turn around and push that wall out. Now how big you want to make your heart, because you can keep pushing, you can push it to the outside of you and then you can push it and encompass the neighbor next to you. And then you can push and encount enclose the whole center in your heart. You can keep pushing it until you enclose the whole world in your heart. And from that sacred space, 
from that sacred, unending well of love, we know that there is one life, one power, one presence, one love. Each and every one of us live that life. We are that presence. We channel that love. And that power flows through us out into this world. And amazing things happen. As we step into this final holy week, I know peace. I know joy. I know awe. I know wonder. I know tight hugs. I know tears of joy, of relief, and of grief. That each of us receives that which we seek in this holy season, in this holy week, that it comes to us on soft feet with warm hugs. And that we treat ourselves and each other gently and kindly and with compassion. And then amazing things happen. And I know this with all of the gratitude in my being. That I speak words of truth. That I speak words to be made flesh. Each in our own way. And I am grateful for a place that teaches me who I am. And whose. I am. And I am grateful for our ministers, our practitioners, our musicians. I am grateful for each and every one of you. I am grateful for the technology that lets us broadcast this into the ether. And I am grateful because it feels good. And I release my word with love into law, knowing it is done even as I speak these words. And so it is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I trust it. I use it. And I love it. And so it is. 